Hey everyone, this is Chris Keys for Premier Guitar. I'm here with Julian Baker. If you're not familiar, she has uplifting music to make you feel good and dance and smile all day. Not the truth. We'll get to that. Her sad songs make us all feel good and not feel alone. Julian Baker, thank you so much for having, yeah. hanging out with us today. Of course, my pleasure. This is a little bit before your tour, so we're hanging out in, uh, somewhere in a studio in Nashville. So tell us about your gear. Let's start with this Telecaster. I've always kind of affiliated with you with, stri uh, with the Strat, with the Tele. Blue one for a while. I saw it with another butterscotch with the Bigsby. Now you got this. So tell me about your love for Telecasters and what this one's all about. Um, okay, sure. So the that first blue guitar that I bought, I got it just from like a Guitar Center used section because it was like for sale and it had been there for a while. And before that, I was playing this enormous, it was like an Ibanez art core that uh -huh. I got because it was sort of, I guess, a, a less costly approximation of a like a Gibson semi hollow body yeah. or like a Gretsch. Okay. But it was awful to deal with for the style of music that I was playing uh, in a band at that time. So I got the Telecaster and I just fell in love with it because it is a super versatile guitar. Mm -hmm. I feel like Strats have a great signature like sound that people go to instinctively because it's like, I guess a paragon of guitar sound. Yeah. But like, I feel like the Telecaster has a lot more breadth and like you can mod it easily mm -hmm. to sound really cool. Like the blue one uh, had a, a, a wiring mod where you could run the two pickup series or parallel. And I f like that broadened the frequency spectrum to where it could be like super tinny and plucky and very, country classic yeah. Kelly sound or it could be really warm and damp. Is that something you requested or had done yourself or is that something I, that you just bought and that's what it was? No, I did that mod. Okay. And then I, this one came with like coil tap capability and I like took it out. We just put like regular straightforward wiring in it uh -huh. and we put this GNL set of pickups in there. And then my other, the blue one has Lollards. Okay. Yeah. And did you have to like, was that there? Or did you have to kind of like, I guess, essentially carve out a hole for the P90 or was that, oh, was we, it? I think we had to sand, I'm trying to think if this one, cause there's three. Yeah, we had to sand this one out okay. to make room, or I don't know if that's a technical term, <laughs> sand, or you know, make space for yeah. this like soap bar. Um, because it originally was just like, a regular little telly neck. Like a, yeah, single coil. Yeah. And, and you actually probably do some of your mods, or at least you're, you're really into sound. You went to MTSU for, for recording and stuff, mm -hmm. live sound. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're a gearhead. And uh, strings, what do, uh, what do you typically play on your telly? I play, I play Ernie Ball, just like regular slinkies. I feel like that's one of the things, you know, st strings, I'm not super particular about. Mm -hmm. I think it's just a matter of needing consistency. Yeah. And I feel like Ernie Ball, they're really consistent. They're what a lot of people reach for. And then it's almost like, not a handicap, but whatever strings you learn on is just the type of feel that you get, yeah, used, to. You get and used to. Yeah, used to it. Yeah, that's like the sensitivity that your fingers develop is like in relation to that. It's like a muscle memory thing too. Definitely, yeah. And I, a lot of times it's almost like it's the way your dynamics are in your songs is uh, finger picking and guitar pick. What kind of guitar pick do you use? Because that's kind of maybe when you dig in a little bit and get a little more aggressive with your sound. Oh yeah, I just use these. I love these just Dunlop. Oh, right, and they have I like, like the, the grip. grippy ones. Do yeah. You, do you use the grip? And Because there are some people that will use the, the grip as the attack to against make the it, strings. No, I just use the like soft end. Okay, so you actually use, use the grip to hold the on. the grip so it doesn't fall out of my hands. I don't know if that's the purpose of it. Now, I've never even considered the fact that that would change the yeah. attack of the guitar. When I was younger, I used to play on these obnoxious gator picks because I didn't realize I was being like so ungraceful trying to play metal music and just breaking every pick I had in two. Jeez. And there's just, they were so thick and they, it sounded horrible. You're there was like, like no delicacy. They're for chugging. Yeah. They're like... There's a time and place for chugging. Yeah, they're like three credit cards thick <laughs> of a pick. I was say like a like, quarter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But no, these are super thin because I just... Now it's way more ethereal stuff. Cool. 
Well, you got two amps, you're playing stereo, is that kind of, or, or I guess to clarify, you have two amps, and do you play in stereo? Um, sort of, like I don't use the stereo effect necessarily to do like panned delays or anything like okay. that. I more just use it to widen stage sound, because I feel like no matter what venue we're playing, as much as we try to cut down on stage bleed, there is still some. Yeah. And um, I actually use the Morley to like send different parts of loops to like different amps. And then it like, if I want to like bring things down, I'll switch to just a single main amp and then use this left amp, or I guess the audience is right amp as like a boost that's like more, because that, it's like a 112. I feel like deluxes are generally kind of midi and mm -hmm. warm and just thick. And then that's the predominant like sparkly scooped tone. Uh -huh. or, I don't yeah. even know if that's right, but it just seems like that one has a lot more. I can kick the bass up really high and I can have a lot of sparkly top end, but it doesn't feel as like midi and warm. And so you're almost, you almost use them complementary to each other, yeah, like exactly. the, how the beasts they are themselves and together they kind of fill out the spectrum. Totally, yeah. You kind of, before, before we're rolling on cameras, you kind of alluded to it. Can you explain further maybe about the wrong way that you use that Morley pedal? Oh yeah, okay. Um, so essentially I saw this like concept executed by a friend of mine in Memphis who had um, two input cables coming out of his guitar. Mm -hmm. And then he would create loops um, on like, to run independently of each other using kill switches. But instead of doing that, I just, basically I run like my whole signal through all the processing. Mm -hmm. And then it goes in to the first Morley tripler and then it goes out three places. It goes from this channel to my, oh wow, it's still on Latin rock. It Which goes is fantastic. out <laughs> from this into like a big, huge looping device okay. that I use to track guitar sound on top of triggered tracks like percussion or sub bass. Mm -hmm. um, so, and like integrate that into here. And then it runs two stereo channels out to um, the Boss RC3 in like input A and B. And then what I do is like, I use it in stereo and when I want to create like the first loop, I kill this channel. Mm -hmm. So it's only tracking on A and then I'll make a second loop on top of it tracking on B. And so they're coming out concurrently, but then I can like use, okay. Now I need to explain. So this I use kind of like a summing device, but it's not supposed to be like that. Okay. Like, I think it's not supposed to be like that. So it comes in here, in B and C, out A and out the in, and goes to the two sides of my guitar. So this is just like a rando dry channel. Uh -huh. This is loop channel A, this is loop channel B. Yeah, see, I have to have all this tape on here to remind me. I was gonna say, I'm glad one of us here has a, a degree in recording engineering oh, and dude, live sound, because it, it's not, I, you just went, wow. The crazy thing, though, <laughs> is that, like, it's not exactly, if I were, like, using my degree, I would have just either bought a pedal that could do this in, like, one pedal, or I would have found a simpler way, or I would just learn how to use Ableton, like all the rest of my friends who perform. But I'm, like, set in my ways. So I'm like, no, I'm just going to draw it out on a sheet of notebook paper and do it like a Tetris maze. Like I need to be able to stop here so I can't go that way. You know what I mean? Do you do, you do that with your whole pedal board? Draw it out, like map it out? Or is it kind of like you just do that as you do it, kind of in your head? Some of it, like this whole thing, I had to sit down and think about yeah. the signal flow. But I didn't think about it. It's funny because I was like meticulous enough to do that, to just kind of draw the map of where and how I want the signal to flow, uh -huh. but not meticulous enough to think about obvious things. Like there's a pretty significant like gain change sometimes when you kick one of these channels off. Okay. Because I guess I just conceptualize it. 
I don't know, like, I don't have the technical terms to explain it, but it's like if you have a hose spraying out of three hose heads, yeah. and then you cap one off, the other two get stronger, obviously. Yeah. But like, that's the only way I've ever known how to articulate or envision like electrical like theory. Yeah. Because I don't have the tangible vocabulary or the tangible knowledge. Yeah. So, I don't know. Just work with it. Like, <laughs> just it's just, it's really Jimmy rigged. Like, but it's but it's done by you, so it's like you know what's going on. Whereas like someone else tries to come fly this machine, they're gonna crash and burn, maybe. Well, yeah, you you, would, you know what's going on. Yeah, barely. But yeah, when I feel like when other people look at it, they're like, "Why would you do it that way?" I'm like, "Oh no, that's just the way that makes sense to me." Yeah, but it's your rig, so that's what it is. Yeah, that's true. You had mentioned uh, Memphis. The shirt says it all. <laughs> yeah, this re-recorded last album. Yeah. With uh, at Ardent. Mm -hmm. I want to dive into the pedal board. The first thing I want to talk about is your love and use for lush reverbs. It strikes me as like a, a as a super fan of like Ryan Adams and Manchester Orchestra. Like you are like reverb on top of reverb on top of reverb. So it's like, let's just dive in. Like what, what is your love for the reverbs and, and specifically to how you're using them on your pedal board? And okay. Um, I think, you know, when I was first playing guitar, some of the first pedals that I owned were reverb and delay pedals, and I got really into, I guess, like time-based effects because they can create so much like character in your tone. Mm -hmm. Like there was a before I really understood how to like use, which it it blows my mind that there was a time, but I guess there was a time like that for everybody where yeah. they were like, "How do you use this tab delay?" Um, I just had like five boss overdrives and I was like this is how you make a tone it's like so bad it's just like <laughs> like whatever it's called like the OD one yeah OD one or like SD one or something oh my god it was so bad and everybody was like you really don't you could lose like two of those um and now they say that to me about reverb but so I what interests me now is not searching for just another like boutique reverb pedal that like does a generic reverb sound because I feel like the blue sky pretty much covers that. Okay. Like, f that's one of my leave-on pedals that I just always set it. I was gonna say set it and forget it. Like I'm in a like an infomercial. Yeah, like, like an info. It's like a crock pot. <laughs> the blue sky, actually. I you just set night. it and forget it. So like, <laughs> I just leave that on. I have like my favorite dialed in, and then it's got insane capabilities and just a really great intuitive natural sound. Okay. But then the rest of the reverbs, like here, my favorite pedal on my board probably is this Walrus Audio Descent right here. It's, um, it is a reverb, sort of. So like that's what they told me when they showed it to me. Um, but what I like is that you can manipulate the um, frequencies of like your dry signal coming in mm -hmm. as well as your wet signal coming out and then I use it sort of like a, almost like a pog noise that okay. just sits underneath my guitar like a pad at like varying oh and then you have three presets so oh, nice. I have my like here I'll this is like the dry signal or not dry um, but like just my basic the blue sky the, the blue, blue sky set and forget it yeah and then let's see nothing else is on so this is just like and then this is like, it's like just barely there a little bit. And then this is like a whole bunch more bottom end and a lot more like decay. But it, see, it sounds like a, like an organ yeah. sound. Yeah, is that something that like would you like would bring on towards the end of like a dynamic close and like turn out the lights or? Yeah, totally. Like, okay. I use this, this is like one of many things on turn out the lights. Okay. But, and then this is like, only wet, so. Yeah, so that, gu that guitar signal is almost gone. Yeah, exactly. Um, but it's cool, because I can just like cycle through them. But, uh, you know, I like it because it doesn't sound like a traditional, like lush, like cathedral reverb. It uh -huh. sounds like kind of weird and almost like a mechanical, like a pog noise. Yeah. I like it. And then there's another thing. Let me see if I can try to do it. Um, 
Oh, it's the reverse. And I think you can turn the, if you turn the time all the way up, it's, it's like a, I forgot. Uh, uh. Yeah, see, it's like nuts. It just makes like a whole bunch of weird noises. And Is that kind of like maybe something that you would use for like a televangelist? Like, I know that you recorded the B3s and Mellotrons and stuff. Yeah. And that's kind of make and do for you. Yeah. I mean, so televangelist has a lot of settings oh, for the on keyboard. the Nord. Okay. But that's like, you know, I use that in like funeral pyre, shadow boxing. It's really nice to just like fill out the space when you want something that sounds like not just another guitar yeah. looped on there. Um, and then, what was I gonna show you? Oh yeah, okay, so this Dweller is super new. I like this one too because it's really versatile. Like, I have it right now where it's, I don't even think, I don't know what this is. Like, it's like the a nomenclature around this, like mm -hmm. if they market it as a delay or market it as a, um, like reverb? A, yeah, like a reverb, and I think it also has some like phase yeah, characteristics too. Yeah, it totally too. does. So there it's just like, like this weird echo thing, but you can turn the, let's see if I can turn the ring. <laughs> yeah. And then it's just like the further down you go with this stretch of like how far apart repeats are, it just makes it sound like a, that's almost like a bit corruption. Yeah. Noise. Like, and then. That's just like a nice sort of, um, like barely even an echo. Almost tapey in yeah. a way. But it's awesome. Like, so that's just a couple of knobs that you can do like all that nuts and stuff. Going back to the descent real quick, um, I know that maybe uh, in previous pedal boards, because I'm one of those dudes that like looks on pedal boards photos, is that I saw you have like an expression or a volume pedal. Do you ever mess around with the expression out on that, having even more control oh, with the descent? No, I, I have not done it with the descent, but I know, I think you can do it with this one too okay. as well. And I think I might bring, I got the, volume pedal off of my board because I wanted more real estate for effects and now I like do all the volume swells like just oh, okay. with my volume knob but I, I kind of miss it because I feel like it would be nice to use it's a little more for like like I guess really dialed in dynamics like you can totally. really more than like your guitar knob yeah and I would love to be able to control that without having to like I feel like there's at least one point in the set where I bend down and I'm like mad scientisting because something goes wrong. Um, but, oh yeah, so this excess, yes, continue. I, I really love, oh no, you're totally fine. Um, this is awesome because I pretty much leave it on the, okay, I'll explain what it is. It's like a distortion pedal, but you can run it series or parallel, and okay. I pretty much leave it on parallel so that it's, it's like backwards of how I guess you would intuitively think it is. So at a low volume, it's super distorted, but oh. the harder you play it, the more your clean tone that's, punches through. It's rad as hell. <laughs> I was explaining it to someone and they said, it's like the perfect shoegaze pedal. Yeah. Because when you're just doing like, little leads or uh, rhythm stuff that you want to be washy um it's really muddy and like fuzzed out yeah, it's and then you punch through with those really clean like lead parts yeah um, and then i was gonna see if i could make this happen um if you do the feedback all the way up oh yeah here. I don't know, it, it's like some kind of thing that happens with the harmonics when you dime the rate and the feedback. Yeah. With, with like the mod in there, it just makes like, 
don't know. It just sounds awesome. It sounds like a little toy box. Do but you, those are like my favorite parts of pedals, is little quirks, you know? Do you find yourself kind of like, you know, assuming you're at home or a studio like this where you have time to kind of mess around, are you, are you getting inspired by sounds by sitting down here in the knees like all this other tweakers and let's see what this chord does and kind of... Totally. And then you're like, wow, that was cool. And then you kind of come up with an idea. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Like, or, you know, like I got this Mel 9 pedal that's a Mellotron mm -hmm. emulator. And that was like a big part of figuring out like the finished product of Turn Out the Lights because yeah. it like has all these amazing crazy sounds that aren't exactly just your run-of-the-mill distortion uh -huh. but I think they're more interesting because there is like a significant like volume jump and it sounds in a way like distortion but um, you know you can have like oh yeah it's like the orchestra sound or like it's like a choir Sorry, where's like But yeah, I don't know. It sounds like so much fuller. Yeah. And yeah. Super cool. Um, and then uh continue here with the bellwether oh, yeah. and the fuzz factory. Here. I I don't know why I skipped over those. Because um, you got excited about the Mel 9. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> That's um, what pedals do. So this Bellwether, I love. I had a, uh, I used to have a Memory Man big box, like the old. Which eats a lot of real estate. So much space. And I was like, man, that sounds great for the studio. But I want something a little bit more, like, compact that retains a good like analog sound yeah. like a warm sound um and but i also like really need a tap delay because i feel like since i'm in control of everything um i have to be able to manipulate the timing yeah. or else it'll get off from the loops and at, then at everything's some point. yeah it's like a yeah. domino effect yeah so if i don't have an adaptable tap i'll get off of the imperfect metronome that I'm creating. So, you know, because I could play too quick, but like... What the fun is I, that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, this one is awesome. It's just like... You're like a really standard tap delay, but it just sounds really nice and it's like super intuitive. I also like that it has like a instead of a selector, it has like a knob, so you can get like weird divisions. Oh, all right. You know what I mean? Yeah, so it's not like a hard set where it's like six parameters you're clicking through it. It's yeah, like a, totally. yeah, you're blending it. Cool. Definitely. And cool. then this is another walrus pedal. I really dig them and Old Blood Noise are like my favorite. Um, Oklahoma. Yeah, Oklahoma Must people. Must be in the water. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Do you want, I, I want to hear, can you play through that? Oh, yeah, and then yeah, definitely. manipulate that? So I kind of want to hear the blending of the. It has like, I think that's like a dotted eighth. I was thinking about it the other day that like, um, it was so long before I knew that certain delay pedals had a dotted eighth setting. And in, yeah, built in. When I learned, I just had to like understand how a polyrhythm worked because I had like a very basic tap delay and I would just be like, like on the one, I would just be like one and two and yeah. three. And so I'm like sitting there trying to like count weird rhythms at a house show like, Trying to dial in. Yeah, it was <laughs> always off. Always off every time. But I don't even, like, so now, 
I forget that that setting's on there all the time because I like never mess with it. Understood a yeah. dotted eighth. Wow, it makes it makes it sound like I'm hating on people who use a dotted eighth setting. Like, just Fed, learn the, the polyrhythm. Yeah, the edge fans are coming out now. <laughs> yeah, they're gonna eat you up. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Fathom, what 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 reason does is that on your board? Okay. Other than the walrus being cool. Yeah. Well, okay. So I like this one because it is a super like full sounding reverb and you can like blend there's like a plate a shimmer a hall and um i think i forget what the other one is but there's like four different kinds and you can blend them so if you mm -hmm. want like half a plate and half a hall you know what i mean mm -hmm. you can sort of like have it chill out in there um like all about the uh, sustain. Oh. Like the freeze function. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And then you can just like let it off and it'll. Like, you know, I, th I feel like I'm not illustrating it well because the Strymon is usually on. Yeah. But like, I don't know, I find that super useful when I don't want something to sound washy throughout the entire set. Just that. Because I also used to like, I feel like use the reverb sound as a crutch because it does sound so pretty. Yeah. But I would stack like four reverbs on top of each other until everything was like completely unable to be discerned. Mm -hmm. You know, it just sounded like mush. So it's nice to be able to choose when you want a super dramatic, like long tail and when you don't. And is the descent in line with everything else or is that like kind of isolated from, or is that everything in, in, in one single path? Oh no, okay, so it just like comes into my tuner here. Okay. And then I have the, some of this has been changed around just because of like space okay. sake, because I had to pull things on and t like I added this fuzz factory for the Boy Genius set. All right. But there's like no reason for me to have that on, <laughs> like in my solo set, except for that I wanted to be able to make like Memorial Day sale at Guitar Center tone <laughs> for this tour. Um, Don't get it confused with I'm like Father's Day or it's yeah, the Memorial exactly. Day one. No, nah. <laughs> the Memorial Day sale, which is like everybody in there acted like Slash. Um, but yeah, so I usually would put, just because I prefer it this way, to like put all the gain stages first. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to have the fuzz factory over here because I didn't want to be sending something all right. Like I wanted it right next to the delay. Okay. So it goes like excess fuzz factory underneath through a snaking <laughs> convoluted thing. Fuzz Factory, and then Bellwether, Fathom, Blue Sky, Mel9, and then into all of this stuff. Cool. Yeah. And then uh, the Paramount is the last thing we kind of didn't touch on. How are you using that? Because throughout your solo set, you mentioned the Fuzz Factory for Boy Genius, which congratulations, that record came out last week. Oh, yeah, thanks. Uh, how are you using the Emerson Paramount? Um, th so this Paramount, I've played a whole bunch of overdrives, and I feel like... I've settled on this one as the perfect, like, tasteful overdrive. You know, because I have the excess to do, like, really kooky, like, washy noises, mm -hmm. and then the fuzz factory to do, like, super lead sounding yeah. leads. But I never really need much dynamic that I can't just get out of a boost. Oh, not pictured is the boost that I usually have on here. Um, it's just like a walrus audio. Oh, okay. Uh, emissary boost, I oh, think yeah, it is. Oh, yeah, yep. But, um, just two knobber. Yeah. Real simple. It's great. It's awesome. Just, yeah, mid and high, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, but so typically there's like not a lot that I can't get in a boost, but this is just, of all of the overdrives I've cycled through, a really nice, transparent, tasteful, 
overdrive that I really like. It's not too, like, muddy. Okay. I feel like that's the one thing I run into is just, like, where in the frequency spectrum it boosts it, which I guess is, like, the point yeah. of all of them. That's their character. But they're, it feels like this one is, like, right in the zone of mid-range that I want. It's just, like, perfect for a little extra grit, but not too much. It's, like, barely there. <laughs> And then the last, I guess, well, the biggest thing, but the, the last thing to kind of touch on would be, uh, are you building the loops live or do you have like your tracks and stuff built into this, the, the big boss, the mm. BC 300, like for something I see that there's appointments or oh, yeah. distant solar uh, systems. Is that like something you're having to build on the fly or you use that with preset and then you're just kind of playing over that? So it's like a mixture of both. Okay. So I have this little looper and I used to build all the loops live into that thing, but it would mean that there would have to be like a 16 bar intro into a song while I like sat there and built the loops. Yeah. So instead, like now I have the piano part of appointments. Okay. And then I like, so it's like split up into three tracks and I have the piano part and the like fun sub uh -huh. like, um, but I build the, all the guitar parts, parts. live. Okay. I just like play them over those tracks. And then if I like don't have enough tracks available on these three, I like revert to the loop station, which is scary. That's the highest stakes of all because these, I, Someone's gonna correct me on the internet, but I don't think that I can link these. Like I can't use this as a master clock for that because okay. I don't, yeah, no, I'm not an idiot. That doesn't have a MIDI in. So I can't like use this as a clock. So they can't like necessarily talk to each other. No, they can't talk to each other. And also I think that the way that I've done the Morley thing, it's like too convoluted that that wouldn't work necessarily <laughs> anyway. So it's I just have to like set up every day in my house and practice and just kind of feel it out. I have a, a lot of my practicing is like exit strategies. Really? It's like, yeah, it's like half like learning the songs and then half the skill of improvisation. So like if I make a wrong note in a loop, like what am I gonna do to fill up space? Well, like how do I mute it? and delete that channel over here while I like play the part that's missing. Yeah, because it's like you don't want to be that person that stops in the middle of the crowd and be like, all right, I'm going to start that loop over. Like you, you kind of got to oh go with God. it. Is that like the that's thrill? That's my worst nightmare. Yeah, is that like the thrill of it versus also the, you know, the anxiety of it? Is I guess the, yeah. the ball of all the emotions while you're trying to figure this out on the fly? Oh, definitely. Yeah, like, you know, we'll have live sets where people will say like, oh, that one part went on for twice as long. And I was like, yeah, I was just playing it over and over again, waiting for the loop to start back. over because I was figuring something out in my head because I did something wrong and I had to think like, how am I gonna fix this situation? So it is, it's thrilling and terrifying, <laughs> but it's fun, yeah. That's cool. I guess the last question, just because you, you've kind of dabbled in both worlds as we've talked about your gear is that you, you're, you're focused on the mids and you're focused on a guitar, but you're also willing to expand the horizon of guitardom in, in terms of like the traditional sounds by with these awesome pedals you have. Does that excite you and you, you know, continue further going down with your records, Boy Genius, any other collaborations you have in the works, chasing down the sounds that are in your head and like embracing that? Cause you know, there's kind of two schools of thought with gear, whether it's digital or, or tube stuff, but just, just the nature of like embracing pedals and some people are like, oh, you know, all I need is a boost and oh, that. Oh, the purest. Yes, yeah. yes. Well, it's, hmm. I think it was an important lesson for me to learn to use those things as tools, but not use them as like a crutch. Okay. So I felt like when I started getting really delay heavy and I had a board that was like, you know, huge minus the bear, like explosions in the sky, yeah. like nonsense. Um, I stopped challenging myself to be more meticulous about the, like the voicing of my fingers and like how I was playing chords and how I was uh, eliciting like dynamics from the guitar. So I would just spend time practicing where I didn't use a pedal board at all. And then come back to this as like 
spice. It's yeah. so like not the main course. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, but it does make me interested. I love when guitars don't even sound like guitars, like a St. Vincent or an yeah. artist like Torres. Um, I saw a, a Torres set recently and she, Mackenzie, like has all these like crazy like pog sounds that make the guitar sound like a synth or like yeah. a really piercing organ. And I think that's just brilliant to really push the parameters of how your instrument can be played, you know? Yeah. Well, I thank you for not only expanding the sonic territory, but also, you know, tugging on our hearts. Aw, thanks. Julian, well, thank you thanks so much for, for doing uh, this with Yeah, me. thank you so much. This is Chris Keys for Premier Guitar. Hey, everybody. Thanks for watching the latest Rig Rundown. Guess what? Every week, we upload a brand new Rig Rundown to PremierGuitar.com a full week before it's available here on YouTube. So to get your gear fix as soon as humanly possible, go to premierguitar.com forward slash rig rundown. And while you're there, be sure to sign up to get an email notification so you're the first to know as soon as each week's new rig rundown is available. Cheers, see you soon.